Is it like you would a show, like you would an exhibition? Or uh, how that's a good question. You know, honestly, what I did was I just, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I have a, a layout program in design on my computer. And I had, a, I had a, a template left over from a previous book, and I just started, I made a text box, and I started writing stories. And then I would, when I was traveling or not in my studio, I might send myself an email, which I cut and paste into the thing. But I had no discipline or structure whatsoever. I just did it when I felt like it. But it wasn't too hard because I know the subject. <laughs> you know, I wasn't really digging for anything original. You know, it was more a question of making something I knew very well look good. But some of these are diary things, and I, I thought, like, how does he remember all of that stuff? I mean, are, are there real diaries, and you take them down off a shelf and transcribe? I them have iron in here. I have diaries from my twenty, from twenty two, twenty three on, and I have them in boxes by year. And I write, I've written them throughout my entire life. And when this project came along, I started looking at them, and there was nothing I could use. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? Why? To practice or what? I, because uh, the problem was that I could never write with a, with a pen. I'm very fond of my handwriting, by the way, as a brief aside. But I could never write fast enough to record my thoughts. And so when I was typing on the word processing program, then, then my speed of thought, and then I could get the words out at about this similar speed. That's very important to be in sync with your mind. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. moral of that story for yeah. sure. Yeah. No, it's true, because if you're always having to like uh, catch up to, to yourself, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's one of the reasons I like to put pauses into you know, spoken things. You know, it gives you a chance to think of what you're going, where you're going. Uh, the headlong sort of stuff is, is much harder to do. Well, you know, this experience made me think, well, maybe I could really learn how to write. But then I realized that I'm not much of, I don't, I, there's not much allegory in me. I'm a formalist. I don't really have, I'm not a storyteller, rock hunter. Like a film director, you know, can't wait to tell you about his next film. I think you tell great stories. I mean, when you talk about where you've been and, and something that somebody told you, or a book you read, uh, especially the one, Shadows? What's the Japanese book? Oh, Praise of Shadows? Mm -hmm. That was a good one, yeah. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that book? Because you really had me when you were like, uh, describing it and what it, what it, how it influenced your work and what you thought about it. And, and uh, Well, I was just uh, with my friend Toby in my studio and I have a special section of books that I keep by at hand, and some of them I've had since the early 60s. I, you know, you're think things I lost in the flood. Well, if I had to, if I had to grab, it was just two sections of one of those, one of those. Uh, but uh, among the books that, that, that I continue to uh, re-examine in the Four Quartets by T.S. Eliot, uh, uh, some of Marguerite Duras' early pieces, uh, uh, that in Praise of Shadows is very good because the imagery is so vivid and the words are so sparse. Uh, and they're not really uh, koans or haikus, they're, but they're just these little... Uh, I know the power of a word in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the pen of the master, and I, I can recognize it, I can't evoke it myself. But, uh, uh, what about that, that, that book? Can you see one or two things about the shadows? Well, I I remember I remember this guy lived in the forest and he had an outhouse and made out of very coarse wood and he didn't separate the construction of this outhouse from the rest of the forest and so the, the wood was one and the same and he talked about you you know how when you go into a, a construction you can smell wood and sometimes you can smell old wood. <laughs> Living in the city, we don't, we don't smell old wood very often. Uh, I, as a guitarist, I go to a luthier's. Uh, to smell old and, wood. And he has wood around. Yeah. You know. So when I think of that book now, that's what came to mind, the, the, the smell of wood in the forest. Uh, I, I love 
uh, this situation where it's almost camouflage, where one thing turns into another, mm -hmm. uh, the wood against the, the forest. And I was just, a, a friend of mine just um, uh, gave me a, a really good um, idea, which is to make a fake uh, path in the back of my place. And because she said, you know, when you, paths are so romantic, you know, you think, oh, you could go wandering off into the forest. And, and I have just a, a forest that doesn't belong to me, but she said, just just make a little path that, that ends about 20 feet into the forest. <laughs> and then you could look at it and go, wouldn't it wouldn't be so wonderful to walk <laughs> into the deep forest. So beguiling. Yeah. <laughs> and all you have to do is really see it. So, I mean, it's like a photograph. You just see it and then your imagination fills in everything else. You know, I, I just um, was working on a project in, in Australia where called Stories in the Dark because I really wanted to uh, uh, work instead of with images, with, with mental images, because people have such amazing mental uh, lives and, they, and you just have to like give one or two little cues and, you, and, and people fill in the rest. It's like your dreams, you know, you suddenly have an enormous visual world uh, that's yours. And um, so uh, it was called Stories in the Dark and they built a theater that was absolutely, totally black, not one little uh, spray of light and the ushers had um, night vision glasses, but they didn't work because you need a little tiny bit of light. So all we did was, um, there were stories and then uh, very big, very, very realistic, very loud uh, sound effects. So the first thing that happens is a huge train comes in and fills the whole room and then just <coughs> stops like <coughs> and you know and suddenly everything because you hear that everything about your feelings about trains and about leaving and about and going are suddenly right there and you're you're somewhere. And I think it, it strikes me that some of your photographs are really like that because you have just a detailed one and you let people you know, uh, uh, stroll around in Paris from that one detail. It evokes so many things. Um, because you've chosen to just take one piece that, but you, uh, I, I think they work for me because I have associations that immediately rush in to fill all of the, the things around it and, or feeling around it. I never stay with the purity of that image. I'm like, oh, that's something he chose from this very complicated visual field and he just said, look at this one tiny little thing and that's where the emotion is in it or that's where the, the feeling of how bright it was that day or you know, just because it's the glint off a glass and you fill in the rest of the day and the rest of the country and the rest of who else is there. You know, so they're, they're very story-like in that way, I, I feel, you know, with your photographs. Yeah. Well, I love, I love hearing your, your re interpretation that way because uh, some of it had occurred to me and others had some of your observation. Uh, I, but while we're on the subject, I'm currently examining this idea that a, a photograph exists between presence and absence. That space between presence and absence. And I'm going to use that as a point of departure into another series of uh, <coughs> With, with, a, with a, a thought like that, I will look in a different way, perhaps, you know. So uh, there's always been this thing about photography relationship to so-called time and things like that, you know. But uh, that led me to believe that we all think that the, the future is permanent. And I'm not sure about it, you know. T.S. Eliot says time present and time past are both perhaps present and time future. I would suggest that he too thought that the future was permanent. So while we're, what happens is, is your interpretation is kind of the result of this approach. This kind of an approach results in that kind of image, uh, which is always, uh, I believe that the art is always better than the artist. The photograph is always better than the photographer. Otherwise, why do it, you know? and. Uh, but I do, I do, I can say that as, when I was in art school in 1960, I had a camera that would only focus down to three feet, and I kept wanting to get closer to the subject. So, I mean, it's, it's an impulse that just that is just clearly uh, followable throughout my entire. It's funny how your tools like uh, create your style. You know, I, I think that sometimes it's. Uh, 
I remember in the mid 90s, there were a lot of tech companies that were asking artists to uh, do things with their products because um, they were uh, uh, basically, you know, kind of some were types of types of ways of getting images, some were sounds, but they didn't really have anything to do with them. They didn't know what to do with this stuff, so they needed artists to work with them. And they would, they called us. I remember this was the worst term: content providers. <laughs> we were supposed to be the content providers, and you're like, oh yeah. Well, let me just come and pour a little content into your like vessel, you know, and then it'll really mean something. And you know, uh, every artist knows that you if you, you cannot pull the form and the content apart, or if you can, um, that it's it's probably not made that well, you know. Um, it, it's just uh, uh, I mean we're not writing philosophy. We're we're working with sound and image and and uh, and and things and they and so the fact that they would contain some kind of message they're very poor message carriers really because they involve our senses and they go through that hole they go through our eyes and our ears and they, and that gives them a completely different meaning I mean you're gonna you know for example you see a book on uh, you see a, a a word on a page and it just says uh, L-I-V-E, and then you hear someone say, live. It's different. I mean, we live in a world of, of signs and symbols, and, and artists translate that into um, uh, sensual uh, things. I mean, that's what we, what we do, and those sensual things give it the meaning that, uh, that it has. So uh, I think it's, uh, anyway, uh, also I, I think in, in the sense of trying to put meaning into work sometimes and back to this idea of how your, your camera influenced you to get closer, um, I think your, your tools and whatever you do really teach you things. So that sometimes I, I know that especially you know, when I try to put meaning into something or make an object mean something, you know, it, it just resists often. And if you don't understand how it works, how a camera works or how your tool works, it will be in pieces on the floor. You, you will just try to force it to mean something, force it to do something, instead of just play. And, I, and the playfulness of so many of your images is just so delightful because you go, you're going, that is just something that he passed by and went, yes, that, you know. And what, what do you think is the equivalent in music of this close-up thing we're talking about? Maybe some parts of improv, when people get very, very deep into uh, the intricacy of, and I'm just saying improv because it's immediate um, uh -huh. nature that, that you don't write the score and then play it, but you're really just responding to it at, at that second. So maybe that, or I mean, many things you could, you could say. I mean, I was thinking, I was thinking volume, but uh, perhaps in some cases it would be an example, but but not always. Uh, do you see, now you also spend a lot of time drawing and you, and you make videos as well, but what do you think in terms of, of your living experience is the relationship between sight and sound in your own work? Well, I'd have to say that um, <coughs> it's emotional and that, you know, I'm probably very typical of many people that um, you very rarely go into a museum and see someone crying in front of their favorite painting. Um, you might see that, but uh, play their your favorite piece of music. <laughs> you know, it's like it's it, it's wired right directly into your heart. You know, and it can also make you dance. Very few people in in museums are dancing when they're looking at paintings. <laughs> Some are, but you know, just, mm, but not really. It goes into your eyes, into a, to a different part of your brain, and it's a very more analytical part. But I think it pr has to do also with focus, that it's easier for you to um, uh, uh, kind of go out of focus with your eyes because they're always scanning things, and then you have to almost force yourself to focus on something. And with your ears. I know it's the same, you're walking through the world, but you, we don't have like things that can, you know, hone in on, I, I wish we could move our ears and and uh, have them 
and close our ears too. That would be really nice. Sometimes to <laughs> flap them closed, you know. But we can't. So, uh, so we're there. They're, we're so vulnerable to that. So I think it's a vulnerability of hearing and and the emotional ties, so that uh, of crying and movement and dancing and uh, I'm not saying that that's uh, it's just a different uh, oh, uh, limbic system that you're tuning tuning into when you're when you're doing uh, imagery and music and of course when you're doing both you've got a whole another crazy way of how do those uh, things work because um, uh, then you have to sometimes choose which you're going to do look at look or listen a little bit more at, when it's a situation like that uh, and that's uh, something that we're we're um, we're very good at because we're always um, multitasking and and using our eyes and ears to to judge let's say somebody's talking to you and they're um they're going that is the nicest sweater and you're not that person hates my sweater. Okay, so you have to like decide whether they're you're going to believe your eyes or your ears. And uh, so what would be uh, and, and we're doing that all the time, which is which is dominating that in that situation. And you're kind of um, so we do that in in terms of seeing things as well. Which I mean, I just I'm just trying to refine my sensibilities. I think you know I I mean. I try to I try to write music, compose music, and so I know that I have to try to hear what I've made. You, you know, it, it, it's really it's as it's tricky. I, I mean, you know, I record little little slugs in Logic, and I just came across them that I hated when I made them five six years ago that actually sound kind of interesting to me now, and I'm wondering why I didn't get it. What was wrong with my perception of them five six years ago? Good question. I mean, I, I just did a. Um, uh, a few months ago, a, um, a five days of recording in, uh, for some reason, uh, in in Copenhagen with Brian Eno, and we were asked by the library uh, in Copenhagen to come and noodle around in the studio for five days. I don't know why. I wish we would do that in the United States. You know, just have these like very weird commissions of, like, why doesn't a library? Uh, commissioned two composers to sit there. They, they just don't. It never occurred to us to do something like that. Anyway, fortunately, we were asked to do that. And what we did in these five days was very weird. We would play for four hours in the morning, but then we would have lunch, and then we would sit and listen to the same four hours. And I thought, this is going to be torture. But I realized I don't know how to play and listen at, at the same time. I thought I did. I don't. And also, when you listen with some through someone else's ears, it's and and also Brian is somebody who is listening in a way that's like he holds seven go. That's fantastic. You know, he's really enth enthusiastic. You know, he's, <laughs> that's um, a great thing. Yeah. Play and listen, John. Do, can you play and listen at the same time when you play? D do you? You're on the spot, John. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it's amazing, yeah. I guess um, also when you're um, just noodling, it's it's a different thing because if you're playing something that you know and you're listening to your performance aspects as opposed to the compositional things, it's a very different experience. Mm. So I mean, I read somewhere that the and I I hold the view that the the the, the primary musical experience is playing the music. The secondary experience would be t to hear live music performed in front of you, and the third, uh, the tertiary experience would be to listen to recorded music. You know, so I, I mean, for example, where you have uh, a noise or scrunk, improvised things, it's a lot of fun for the people sitting up there doing it. Sometimes it's a little difficult for those of us in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm, you know what I'm getting at. But, but yeah, I've seen those faces. Like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some uh, some composer, Varese, uh, uh, s said to Feldman, uh, uh, "When you're playing, listen to yourself from the middle of the auditorium." You, you've heard that idea, right? Yeah. Uh, it'd be nice if you could do it if you could project yourself in that way. Yeah, it would. 
But I also, I mean, I edit by looking at people. I mean, people in audiences think they're invisible. You probably think you're invisible. I'm looking at all, I have a pretty yeah, great a view of all of you. Yeah. <laughs> and I can see when some of you are like, oh God, they're rolling your eyes, you know? And yeah, I, I can tell when somebody's change. yawning in the back <laughs> row, right? <laughs> change our topic, yeah. change the tack. Um, because uh, it's, um, uh, it's very re reliable, you know? People in unguarded things are, are, are reliable, you know? You don't have to look a certain way. You're just you're just kind of considering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I asked a lot of editing of shows that way. I, yeah. I asked Leonard Cohen. I said, "How do you play in front of uh, eighty thousand people?" He said, "Well, you just pick the prettiest girl in the third row and yeah. just play the whole concert there." Leonard, the prettiest girl. <laughs> That's what he said. Uh, All right. <laughs> Did you read his book, Flame? Just came out. Yeah, I did. Uh, it's, it, it just came out, and you know, it's it's like a, I just also got a giant block of of like eighty vinyl things of David Bowie. It, you know, it doesn't just because you're dead doesn't mean that you can't release records or put out books. <laughs> so Flame has just come out, and it's Leonard's. Uh, drawings and poems and things from, from his last uh, uh, few months and he worked really hard uh, on that and wouldn't take phone calls and he said I've got to finish my book I've got to finish my book wow. it was such a, that. yeah it's in, probably right in the bookstore you can go and get it right now flame it's called flame um, does I, anybody have any questions for either of us yeah, I just have an observation, just a thought that occurred to me as a photographer, and I'm guessing uh, there's quite a few of us here, that you were talking about uh, creating the music is primary, listening to it live yeah. is secondary. And I was thinking that as a photographer, I get such a great kick in that moment in the solar plexus, and you know it, I'm sure, than other photographers know it when you know you got the picture. This is the greatest moment. Then making the print is okay. Looking at the original print is quite fine, if it's a fine print. And then looking at a printed page would come third. I'm thinking, so it's just uh, occurred to me, I wanted to share it. I don't know if anyone would concur. Yeah, I think that initial thrill is it. When you, when you see it, we get the idea. It's just, it wasn't there, and now it's there. I mean, it's a very godlike thing to take a photograph or to be an artist or to make something, you know, that to really literally create it. So it's really, um, and I, I find that also, I was, I've just been thinking about this, maybe because I read this Michael Pollan book uh, of How to Change Your Life. And in it, one of the things he says, which I've been thinking about the last couple of days, is um, look at kids and you realize that they're all tripping. <laughs> <laughs> they're on. They're t completely tripping there. You know, they're going, "Oh my God, a light!" And they just run towards it, and it's, oh, something's zooming in. It's something's getting bigger and bigger, and I don't know why. You know, cause it's got, you know, and wow, you know. So, and and then we kind of gradually keep losing, and we we explain why things are getting bigger because they're getting closer, and because all sorts of other phenomena that suddenly have a reason to explain all of these crazy things that are happening. But uh, I, I think uh, that that excitement of, of seeing things for the, feeling like you're seeing it for the first time, or just discovering it, just um, capturing it, is the one that is like, that's, that's the thrill. That's, that's, the thri that's why I'm in this, for that thrill. Endorphins. Yeah, yes. yeah that, is a, that is a thrill, yeah. Brad. Ralph, you, um, when you were talking about when you were taking the photographs for the Synambulist, uh, you made a gesture to the top of your head. It was very brief, but you made this gesture at the top of the top of your head to indicate something about that space that you were in. Sure. It was that you spoke about some of the great artists that we know and that how they sp perhaps spend more of the time there. That's one part of my question, if you would comment on a little more about that. And the other part is about, um, earlier this year, uh, some of us know that you were awarded the Medal of uh, the Chevalier in the Legion right. of Honor in France. And has that influenced your direction for 
future work in any way? Well, obviously, uh, that decoration uh, released a lot of creative energy, and uh, it, was, it came at a point in my career that uh, it felt very good. I, I probably wouldn't have had the same reaction if, it, if I had got it 20 years ago. But one of the things is that because uh, Lori has arts and letters also in France, and uh, it's such a rich culture that for such a rich culture to acknowledge something you've done uh, tends to enhance its, its reward factor. Uh, so uh, it's also made me uh, realize I had thought that, you know, I was going to Europe through all the 80s <coughs> and 90s, mostly to France, and I was thinking, you know, uh, there's a lot of other places in the world I might have gone to. Instead of going four or five times a year, just go two or three times a year and go someplace else. But now, I'm, I'm very happy that I did, and uh, I'm one forthcoming project will be a really big tome entitled L'Histoire de France, where I will definitely say everything I feel for, for France. And I'll enlist uh, some of their, their great philosophers and to contribute and stuff like that. So, you know, give them, I need a little support. Yeah, so anyway, endorsement. So, uh, but as far as, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that when I made my first breakthrough book, I did most of it in a weekend. And I was at my source that weekend, and it was the first time I you even knew it hand. exists. Yeah, it's, it's still up there. I guess. Good, good no, I think, on that. No, back in those days, I had a lot of hair. Oh, he's brushing his hair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, that's that's that source thing. You see, I believe that when 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 some guy my age in Wall Street is, is coming up with a derivative, uh, I think he or she. Uh, is coming from the same place in the human spirit where all creativity is born. It's how, it's how the results are analyzed afterwards and makes a difference. But I think that, that anything a human being creates comes from that place within the human spirit. And I think that, uh, for example, I, as I mentioned earlier, the Picassos and Bachs and people, they were able to get there on a regular basis. Uh, it seemed to be part of their technique to go just straight to that place. And it's haunted me all my life, basically. Uh, that's essentially what I wrote mostly about in my journals. How I made a picture or what led to what led to what. Uh, but what, what, what has haunted you exactly when you said I didn't quite get that? Well, you know, when you have a period where you do so much in very strong work, <laughs> as opposed to other periods where it's coming very slowly and difficult. Uh, uh, the Somnambulus was a 48-page book, which brought me my recognition. 36 of those pages I made in two days, three days. And then I spent basically three years doing the re remaining 12 pages, or, you see, which was more of a normal rate of, uh, of production. So this told me that many of the artists that I admired so much, had studied historically, were able to access that. Uh, uh, I read uh, Bergman on Bergman during this period. He had just made Persona, and, and he stated that while making Persona, his 26th film, he was 50 years old, an international master, he, he said he realized for the first time the creative potential of his own ambivalence. That got me through a very cold winter. So, so I was able then to consider my ambivalence as, as a positive rather than a negative component, which would then mean that I'd like more photographs better, you know, or, or acknowledge them as, as part That's of process. That's a wonderful insight to see ambivalence as a, as a, sure. as a subject. Yeah. And, uh, and that, uh, the other thing I, was, I had forgotten to, to mention about being in the studio with Brian Eno was that he absolutely loves failure. If there's something that just isn't working, he's just delighted. He's, he's just because it gives him a chance to rethink it or redo it, you know, and and not just do the same old thing that he knows how to do, uh, but it it just didn't work. And now what do you do? So uh, right. yeah, and so failure is is also a, a really wonderful topic. And oh, that's I, fabulous. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the 
kind of sharpness and clarity of ideas sometimes just feels a little too brittle, you know, a little too, you know, um, easily earned, you know, and that the world so much it has so much cloudiness in it and so much um, uh, uh, edges that are turning from one thing into another, and just as you think, as you touch it, it turns into another thing, and you realize that's actually the action, rather than trying to identify that thing or that thing. It's the turning. You know. I mean, I write in here that artists learn from their failures. The failures are more re more valuable than your successes. You know, what do you learn from your successes other than how great you are? No, that's not that's not what you want. Uh, but that's not true of brain surgeons or bridge builders <laughs> or something like that. They don't learn much from their failure. They're pretty quickly out of business. Um, <laughs> I have a question all the way in the There's back. There's somebody in the back there. Yeah, I see a hand. Go ahead. Um, you were talking earlier about John Sarkovsky and when you started out in the 60s. And even then, I, that was still a, at a time when there was a ongoing debate about whether photography was even an art form. And I'm wondering whether now in the age of Instagram, the role of photography and its acceptance by culture and its pervasion and into culture has changed so radically. I'm wondering whether if you were to start out now, mm -hmm. uh, and not technologically, but in terms of your own sensibility, if it would be a totally different journey because... It's a complex question. It's a great question. Uh, uh, I did a, a, a TED talk about uh, how visual literacy has ascended uh, uh, because of, of iPhones and things like that. However, the theory was that the same software that made everybody a photographer made everybody's photographs look the same. The software is very pragmatic, dogmatic in that way. Uh, I will say that I go on I, various blogs and su subscribe to every morning, uh, Lloyd de la Photo is one and a few others. I see what's going on, what young people are doing today, and if any of them had been around in 1970, they'd have major careers today. Uh, because, because our visual, uh, uh, our, our visual excellence has massively increased. Uh, I think sophistication is the term I really should use. I think people are much more visually literate than they were before. Uh, and also, I mean, the number of artists is, is, oh. is staggering. I mean, I, I'm somebody who was like down in Soho in the 70s, and and uh, with one gallery and one restaurant, and uh, sure. food food restaurant, and uh, and Ivan Carp Gallery, yeah. even yeah. before Paula Cooper. So, um, and it, and then uh, of course exponentially there are uh, there were maybe like 70 artists. And you kind of knew all of them, and they were all living within about six blocks. Mm -hmm. And that was it, that was the art scene. Okay. And now, I mean, with the number of, of people graduating from a single art school, that, that's th three times the entire artistic you know, community of Soho at that time. I mean, the question is, are they being absorbed because it's a bigger population? Well, I think they're doing yeah. other things. I think it's really improved a lot of other people who, uh, um, who leave art school or sometimes um, uh, it, it, it's pretty daunting to get into the, that that scene so um, there are many other scenes to uh, to work in and I think it's it's made uh, the visual um, life of the country much wilder and richer that a lot of artists are making that you know in terms of uh, graphics in terms of all sorts of uh, levels of design. It's it's artists trained in art schools who are contributing that to, and it, so it, the whole country looks a lot better. It's much more interesting to look at in terms of the layout, in magazines, and um, furniture design, and these are these are things that um, uh, didn't used to look so beautiful because they're made by, by sure. artists now. I mean, I mean, I have no doubt that cinema is probably of all the visual arts the most the most uh, influenced by uh, current technology. I think the next Citizen Kane is going to be shot on an iPhone big time. I, I have no doubt about that. I, I saw that one unsane that Steven Soderbergh made on the iPhone. It pretty much looked like it was shot on an iPhone. It wasn't that great, but uh, I like the idea that, that, that because of our delivery systems, I'm, I'm big on that notion of delivery systems where you, you look on your laptop. Uh, I was telling a friend, a, a director told us that uh, 
he's doing a film and he said he can't get a crew because everybody's working on Netflix and, and, and all these series. So you could, you could easily opine that, that uh, our visual uh, dynamic is, is massively enhanced at this time. Uh, in answer to, to, to be a young artist at this time, it's always difficult to be a successful artist. Uh, since the Lasco Caves, you know. <laughs> so I, I guess that uh, even today, uh, I mean, I, I, once in a while I'm just knocked out by something I see. There's a Chinese photographer, Ren Han, who uh, uh, just, I can't believe how, how uh, creative he was, you know. Uh, he died in his late 20s, but I mean, it's still happening. I can't keep up with uh, Chelsea and Brooklyn and the art world. I mean, uh, we went uh, last Sunday to Deacon Bia, uh, Beacon Bia, <laughs> and uh, that was that was old home week. All those people you were saying from Soho back in the day, you know, Sarah, Walter DeMaria, Smithson, and Chamberlain, all those types were there. So. Yeah, that's a, it's an utterly different world now. I mean, I I I really like it for that reason. Yeah. You know, I I don't have any nostalgia for. Uh, I don't want to give up my iPhone. I have a nostalgia for the future. That's what I, it's the last sentence in my book. Uh, I hope to be around to see a lot more of this going on, uh, because I think I think ultimately we might see a content that we have never seen before. Art has great art has always delivered as something that we had previously uh, not known about. I'm looking forward to um, interspecies art. <laughs> interspecies art? Yeah, I mean to understand um, uh, other creatures and make art for them and, and understand their art forms. The concept? Yeah. yeah Have you seen any, by the way? I've made some. Do you mean Lolabelle or something? Uh, no, co uh, for, uh, music for dogs. Music for dogs is interspecies. Yeah. Right. Okay, that's and, true. Uh, and I, uh, it's, it's some of the uh, most exciting things I've, I've been involved in. I really, really love well, uh, trying to make contact with another type of mind because the art mind is one that is generating objects and new styles and new colors and new kind of, you know, maybe ways to look at things. but jump out of your mind and to another uh, type of, of mind and it could be very, very interesting. I mean, I just got into that because it actually started with talking to young artists at, um, uh, at RISD and I was doing a, um, a commencement speech there. So I was, my, my job was to talk to, to to, to congratulate all these young artists and tell them how easy it was going to be to get a job in the art world and how their student debt would be wiped out and any, any minute, you know, and I'm just sitting there wearing the mortarboard and the, the robe and it was really hot and I'm feeling like a total fraud, you know, just trying to convince the parents that they just spent $79,000 a semester on it. It was all for the, you know, good cause of getting their child into the, um, photography world or the whatever and I was just thinking oh my god what am I doing here and uh, um, and I was because I was like in a daze because it was too hot um, I was sitting next to Yo-Yo Ma and he was going to be talking or playing in the thing as well and I said you know but sometimes when I'm playing a concert I look out and I think I imagine that the whole audience is dogs <laughs> and he said I have that fantasy too and I said you do? I said, okay, the first person who gets to do that has to invite the other one. So I got the opportunity to do that. In Sydney, uh, I was asked to do, uh, curate a big festival at, called Lives in the Opera House there and uh, lots of different venues in Sydney. So I got to invite all my favorite playwrights and musicians and writers and poets and photographers and filmmakers and, you know, it was wild. And so when I was talking to the promoter of the festival, I said, and I'm also going to do a concert for dogs. And he, he, he didn't say concert for dogs. No, he just writes down concert for dogs. <laughs> and I said, you know what that is? <laughs> anyway, so we did this concert. And um, it, was, uh, it was short. It was 20 minutes long, uh, attention span. But, you know, um, it was in the, you know, the steps of the Sydney Opera House. This, that, that's the one with the big sails right on the harbor. 
and has a flight of steps. It's just magnificent. And, and we thought a few hundred dogs would come. Thousands of dogs showed up. Thousands. And uh, they immediately overflowed our three areas of little, medium, medium, big onto the steps. And they were like all there. And so we started it and, and um, uh, it began with an invocation for the whales. So in, in their frequencies, because the whales are right there in the harbor. And um, because why do animals sing? You know, to find each other. Whales in the ocean, dogs establish their GPS. So I'm over here, I'm two miles over here, I'm back in your backyard. I'm over there. That's what they do. That's why they sing to each other and talk and bark. So anyway, um, there, it was a, a small ensemble playing for these dogs. And without the very low end things, which make dogs nervous, sounds like thunder or bombs, you know, so those were edited out, as well as the high frequency things that makes things nervous, making dogs nervous, but um, anyway, I have to say that there uh, are a lot of Australian dogs who just want to rock. <laughs> and they were there like, and they didn't know what they were doing there, because, you know, it didn't, wasn't the dog run, and who knows why you're at a concert anyway. Your friend told you, you just gotta come to, we don't know why we go in either. You know, we're just there. And so they're there, and uh, we're playing the music for them. I'm like, ah, okay, I'm going into another realm here. Uh, and I'm just looking at all the dogs and, and watching them listen to this, because they're exquisite listeners. Exquisite. Those of you who have dogs and cats know that they're, they're, we have a lot in common with them in terms of, of hearing. And uh, my favorite were the droolers. And they, they were in the front row, and they were just like... <laughs> just listening, you know, and uh, it was... Um, it was one of the best experiences of my life because at the end they were all so polite, you know, and they had all the vets were Australian vets had lined this whole thing uh, with their their trucks because they were afraid there was going to be some dog fight or you know, you know, whatever. And they there wasn't because as I said they didn't know what they were doing there. So uh, <laughs> at the end they said, okay, let's just make some noise. I mean it was just like so quiet. So. I said, little little dogs get get all the little dogs, you know. And like, ar, ar, ar. okay, medium, come on, join in. Ar, ar, ar. And then big ones. Ar, 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 ar. And for five minutes, they barked and howled. And I thought I was gonna die from happiness. I mean, it was just like the most beautiful sound you've ever heard because they were just barking because they could, and because it was suddenly that the thing to do, and it was. Uh, very, very loud and very, very beautiful. And, and so I thought, well, you know, what if we could start making things that would break out of our own set of what we think art is or what we think music is or what we think we're doing here anyway? You know, what are we doing here anyway? What are we making this for? So uh, my answer is, is sounds really shallow, but it's for fun. <laughs> you know, it's really for fun to see what you can make. And um, so anyway, um, when I think of um, the future, I don't, it's dreary for me to think of more technology. I'm, I'm very involved in tech stuff. I'm, and uh, whenever, we, I'm doing a lot of VR these days, and so whenever I go to a film festival, for example, where we have VR installed, uh, it's really deeply snobby. We refer to the other works in the festival as flat films. Oh, flat films. <laughs> flat films. That's, that's the flat film. I mean, you okay. know, I mean, I don't really mean that, of course, because uh, m many of the greatest treasures of, of human creation are are uh, in the earliest black and white films, and uh, not to mention the entire history and all of the energy that goes into making uh, films. Uh, but uh, I, I think that um, it, it's it's easier to get carried away with the technology than it is with the reason of why we're making these things, you know. Uh, but you know, that technology is a product of, of, of our systems today. And one of the things I'm, I'm trying to get my head around, which I thought of while you were speaking, is uh, uh, 
what is the Marxist position on artificial intelligence or virtual reality? You know, seriously, I, uh, I've been reading the, the Communist Manifesto and I can't seem to get it to, to apply to what's really happening now, you know? And, and I would be, I love technology too. I think it's, it, it's, it's just the greatest thing. It, I, after 60 years at the wet dark room, I'm really enjoying working digitally. <laughs> I can assure you of that, you know, so. Uh, well, that's the operative word is work because, of course, that that work was written in mid-19th century and when people just were, were beginning to wonder what work was and it starts out, the manifesto of Spectre is haunting Europe, as if this, that is not like right now, and ends with workers at the world unite, as if that weren't right now. At the same time that that manifesto is being written, Another incredible work about work was written, which was Bartleby the Scrivener, Melville's work, which is about, those of you who know, a guy who works on Wall Street, and he's like doing, he's basically an accountant, and he's, and he's just a drudge. He's just doing the same thing all the time, and he's like really fed up with it, and he's like, what is, I can't stand it, and he just, finally his boss says, you know, Bartleby, what, you know, you're slowing down, and he just, what, uh, you don't want to work, and he says, well, I prefer not to. <laughs> now that sentence is, come, came ringing down the 19th century in, again uh, in, in parallel to the Communist Manifesto, which is another thing about what we're doing. We in the visual uh, world call it work. Musicians call it, I'm going to go and play somewhere. You know, so uh, I think that the work ethic in, in terms of how it's entered the art world uh, tends to be, I mean, you, you would never, I don't think musicians would say, uh, come and hear my new work. They would give it a title, you know, but, but visual artists can easily say, the title of my new exhibition is my new work. And you're like, that's vague, <laughs> but, you know, because work is such a, such a, um, uh, a, 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 a kind of marker of how you go through your career in it that it is then yeah but when I'm not working that's the painful part exactly. that, that, that the downtime is, is not the good time but you play you, you play music in your downtime sure there's always something going on yeah uh, but, but I know what you mean I like the, the mu musicians play uh, I have a I have another thing that I'm considering uh, as a passionate musician also. I never put myself on the line. I, I make my living as a as an artist photographer, but I never uh, put myself on the line with my music because I'm going to make a living from that. And I also know a lot of passionate, uh, very advanced amateur photographers who made good livings and doing something else. So there is that aspect too of, you say, I'm going to profess this, I think is a term, right? <laughs> <sighs> Got time for one last question in the back here. Cecilia? Oh. Uh, Mr. Anthony, you said earlier that the eyes have eyelids, but the ears don't have earlids. Yeah. And I was thinking about that because when you close your eyes, and I think Lori Anderson referred to this, you actually don't stop seeing. You see internally. And I'm just wondering about the, the tension between the internal world, if you take a photographer like Cindy Sherman or Man Ray even, or some of your work versus photojournalism, which is absolute reality. How do you... Um, strike that balance. Where, where do you see I have an internal answer. reality? Yeah. Uh, a current thought. I've been reading uh, Theodore Adorno, who said, uh, to think is to identify. We all know we think in words, and words are essentially identifications and are essentially images. Uh, it's very hard to, to think of nothing, if not totally impossible. Uh, I took a picture recently uh, off the highway. It said, signal ahead. Well, what was this? <laughs> Sign, signifier, signified, etc. Uh, I think what happens is we tend, to, we tend to determine how we're going to process our perceptions according to our individual matrix of needs at any given instant. Uh, because I will, I will take a... I will work on a series of photographs for three or four or five years. Uh, I will alter my answer to your question 
at different phases throughout the, the production, of winding up with a book or a series or an exhibition or something. Uh, but I, I love all these things that have to do with the nature of our perceptions. There's this Greek term, solipsism, how we feel determines how we perceive reality. Therefore, the only thing that's real is how we feel. Well, that's great if you're an artist in studio. It's not so good again if you're a brain surgeon or a bridge builder. But as a full-time solipsist, uh, I, can, I can answer your question uh, one way now and another way in a couple hours. Did you ever take a picture of nothing? Well, one time, uh, in my early days in New York, I was sitting over with some friends on Ninth Avenue, totally stoned, listening to Coltrane, and somebody says, oh man, let's take a picture of nothing. You know, so so and we'll, we'll meet tomorrow or the next day and we'll show you what we got. And I went out and I took a picture of the sky, no clouds, but it was completely recognizable as this guy. It was just a gray wreck. I won the contest. I was very, I'm very proud of that story. It's in the book. <laughs> so the answer is yes. <laughs> nothing but you can tell what it was. I've seen that in nothing before. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you, thank, you, thank, you, thank you so much for welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, if you do not already have a copy of Self-Exposure signed, uh, you can purchase one in the back. If you already have it, but it's not signed, you can line up over here if you have it and it is signed. Feel free to hang around. There might be a little bit of wine left. There was when I was back there. That was a while ago. Thank you all so much.